I'll do it myself. I uh, Photoshop that, right? Can I do Yep. Okay, everyone. Hello and welcome to our Concussion Legacy Foundation webinar. And with our very special guest today, Lance Picciani. And um, we're gonna learn about his uh, experience with brain trauma and linked to mental health. So thank you everyone for coming along today. I'm Anita Ciliato, the Executive Director for the Concussion Legacy Foundation. It's great to see so many of you here today and um, thank you for, for spending some time with us to learn about personal stories from some notable Australians. Um, CLF, as you may be aware, is an organisation in Australia that, that was set up last year. And um, it is a global organisation, but the Australian chapter has only been launched very recently. And really our aim is to basically uh, you know, educate, have education programs, uh, offer support through our CLF helpline, and as well as that, offer some uh, opportunities for research. We're very much focused on also um, children's sports and ways to modify sports to make them safer. I must um, sort of indicate that we are not against sport. We are very much uh, for sport, but just looking at ways that we can make it safer for our community. Today, we are very honoured to have with us Lance Piccioni, who's going to talk about his personal experience in relation to trauma and mental health. Um, the format of the webinar will be that I'm going to ask Lance a couple of questions, um, and following that, there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A from the audience. So you can um, put your questions in the chat box, and um, we can, we can uh, go through those at the, at the end of this. Just a quick note, the webinar is being recorded. So if you do miss something, do not worry. Um, you can uh, access it, it'll be sent to your uh, email uh, once completed. Also, just a shout out, please uh, join on our social medias or on our socials. We'd love to sort of grow this community. It's a very special community and a community where we can all support each other and um, learn in this space. So please get onto our socials. Um, and, and obviously, if you haven't signed up for our newsletter, we would love for you to do that. And then that way you'll get any notifications of webinars or programs or events that are happening for concussion, uh, for the Concussion Legacy Foundation in Australia. Okay, Lance, um, thank you so yeah. much for joining us. So Lance was a, a first round draft pick for AFL. Um, uh, started off with Adelaide, then went to Hawthorne yep. and North Melbourne, so quite varied. Yep. Yep. Did suffer many concussions and head impacts, um, but didn't really realise till later on that perhaps there was a connection between those head impacts and um, his mental health. So yeah. um, Lance, yep, Lance is also the founder and CEO of Love Me and Love You, which is going to be called Never Alone Foundation, but I'll let Lance explain that to you. Um, he's really uh, has turned around and tried to make the most by giving back to his community, improving the well, mental well-being um, of just not only himself, but others to live a more happier and fulfilling life. So uh, we are very proud uh, and honoured that Lance is one of our ambassadors and also a member of our advisory committee. And we have, um, Lance has, has shared so many of his stories and he's supported us in so many ways. So thank you, Lance, and welcome to the webinar this evening. Thanks, Anita. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. What an intro. Um, no, 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 very happy to be here. It's um, uh, obviously when you uh, first approached me a, a little while ago now with the idea of uh, getting involved with the Coastal Legacy Foundation, what it was all about and what we're trying to do. And as you said, it's not about being against sports and, and, and its participation, but being pro-sport, but 
what we're just trying to do in normal life is actually trying to make the, the environment safer for people and, and taking those opportunities to participate and making sure that they can, you know, play a more fulfilling sort of um, career at whatever level that might be. So, um, but, you know, from my my experience, you know, it comes back to the fact that, I'll, you know, I played professional sports back in the olden days when these types of conversations around concussion wasn't really had. So, you know, it's been 18 years since my last AFL game um back in 2005 so it's been a lot it's been a long time been a long time uh you know between drinks with all that sort of stuff but what my, my obviously experience through this and and stuff that you just touched on you know and, and relating it to the mental health aspect of life um you know it's you know the more research obviously we're all doing into this space the more awareness we're getting around it the better conversations we're able to have with it enables us to you know put those sort of those safer boundaries around um you know sport and life you know, and how actually and how important they are together so Absolutely. it's really Absolutely. it's been pretty awesome actually so. yeah no i think um you know it is really important for this foundation to be here as well because not only are we trying to find safer ways to sport but we're, we're trying to find ways to support players yeah. like yourself who have played yep. in those days where there were yep. no protocols um, so we need to build that sense of belonging, that community where people can um, share and, and be supported and learn ways that they can cope in these times when they may not be feeling, um, you know, quite happy with what's going on. Let's yeah. talk about your AFL career in general. Oh. So, I mean, when did you start quick, playing? Quick conversation, Anita. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, how long <laughs> did you start playing AFL? Uh, well, I played so... As a as a junior, I, I played. I only started playing my first game of footy uh, when I was eleven, um, with a few mates. But AFL, I was drafted out of the uh, into the AFL when I was like seventeen and four months, I think. Um, oh, so I was still seven. I was. This is the time. Uh, obviously, now it's changed. But I mean, when I when I got drafted, each club was allowed to have uh, one seventeen year one pick one seventeen year old, um, and I was Adelaide's uh, Adelaide's choice. So yeah, I was I was seventeen when I played my first game, um, and then yeah, so you were a first round pick as well. So first round, first, first round, round first pick. round draft pick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to the 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 reigning premiers at the time. So Adelaide had won the just won the premiership, and so they thought then they'd uh, pick me, and um, I sort of didn't work out the way that we both wanted it to. Um, my time at Adelaide started. Pretty pretty good actually, you know. I was, you know, I was, I was a member of the member of the team for the first sort of half of the season, um, in and out sort of thing. But that was just the time because I was seventeen and didn't really know what I was doing in terms of playing against real men. Um, but you know, working through that, and then I spent the the rest of the two years in the what they call just in, in AFL wilderness, um, mm-hmm. playing a lot of uh, playing a lot of reserves. So we're playing at Glenelg in the state league there, and then. Um, you know, but my ways of life sort of got messed up pretty pretty uh messed up pretty quickly and wasn't giving myself the best opportunities and we talk about opportunities before at the very start you know giving ourselves the best opportunities to play a sport or to do anything in life and you know when you take away those opportunities yourself you, you're never going to succeed so it's um uh, but you know I it's just, been a couple, of years, a couple of years there yeah i just wondered like um you know being drafted at 17 was it always your dream to be an afl player and oh, what did it feel like when you actually were drafted uh it's more related more sort of um i don't i i, I sort of knew without being without being sort of egotistical in this way but like i started talking to afl clubs when i was 13 um, okay and so it was sort of that conversation that was always going to be had um you know been playing in states and winning national awards and all that sort of stuff with footy and you know, captain of all the, uh, you know, all Australian teams and lots of stuff as a junior growing through. So uh, the conversation for me around being drafted wasn't a uh, one of surprise. Um, but, you know, obviously that that, that day that, uh, that it happened, um, it was actually, I still I still remember it. It's, it's been quite bizarre. There's not too many things I remember from that so, that so long ago, but the day I got drafted, I was, uh, I had my year 12 English exam in the morning and I had to, uh, had to bolt out of the, um, uh, out of the exam and find a, t- a TV uh, in one of the teachers' rooms, um, 
and mm. I knew I was sort of pretty uh, pretty confident that Adelaide were going to pick me and they they got in there at like pick 14 sort of thing and then the teacher was trying to kick us out from the uh, from watching the TV and telling us to get out. So I was just like, oh, I just wait for this last pick anyway. Um, Adelaide come up and, um, you know, it was obviously a, a great experience for, you know, obviously family as well to sort of uh, to to experience that sort of thing. Um, but then it sort of uh, reality hit when I had to had to move over there. So the day after my last exam mm -hmm. in year 12, I um, was straight on a plane over to Adelaide, which is a uh, interesting place to go as a 17 year old. <laughs> it would be, I think yeah. even that would yeah. be a challenge in itself. Um, oh, I love that story about, you know, running out of your English exam and trying to find a television like, just, um, you know, it is a, a very special memory. And so some of your highlights from football, what were some of your highlights? I know you've played in three different teams. Yeah. Uh, tricky one, Anita. Like, as I said, I played three different clubs. It's mm. obviously my first game is, is always the thing that you remember. You know, I remember kicking my first goal. It was even the funny of the conversation I just had with my two sons, uh, Lenny and Alexander, seven and five years of age. And, um uh Lenny he asked me before um did I kick a goal did I kick a goal in my first game so I was like that was quite a bizarre question for a five-year-old to come up with but he asked me that today so I was like yeah I did I had a kick it with my second kick so that was obviously a memory that I that I carry on you know I hold on to and being able to you know being able to share those stories and those experiences with my boys is is, is the most important part I think from my experience in playing AFL um and then obviously the work that we do now, but you know, playing at Hawthorne was pretty cool. You know, playing in finals there was a was a pretty cool experience. You know, I got to play with. It's more the fact that of, of who I got to play with as well. You know, I got to play with an absolute champions of the game um, from all three clubs that I played at, and you know, I was very happy with it all that happened. But you know, there's the there's the goods and the happiness and the successes that come with it. But there's obviously the other side of it that. Um, that is not often talked about, you know, and the, and the injuries and, we, you know, the thing we're talking about here with brain trauma and the amount of concussions that I would have had throughout my career playing, you know, from juniors through the AFL and even post um, the amount of head traumas and the head shakes that I would have got. Um, but, you know, then the, obviously the mental health Im impact that, that life has on you as well with, with playing sport um, at a, such, such a high level and the expectation of playing that sport um, amongst it and when things aren't going that you know the way you want them to you know the 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 way that you deal with life is is probably not um it's it is common in sort of how people deal with these impacts in life as as a general in terms of the community but it seems to be when you're in a professional sport and you're sort of really trying to chase that way of actually being better and bigger and all that sort of stuff that the way that you deal with it actually then becomes worse that makes sense. So yeah. instead of it sort of just going, okay, I might sort of you know, deal with it this way and my impact is here and that sort of stuff. When you play, I believe, when you play professional sports, um, and, and no matter what sport or, or a, a sort of a sort of thing you do there, is that you actually have a, a bigger, um, we'll call it a bigger resilience level or a bigger impact in terms of your obsessive compulsive components of actually doing something and actually reaching that level because that's what you sort of really need to be able to sort of actually drive yourself through that. But then when you actually try to deal with a lot of things, you actually drive it harder and, and it actually makes it more of a, probably not the best of impacts. So, um, but, you know, Chris, kicking goals, all that sort of stuff, you know, as, as we say, running on, playing on the MCG is one of the most amazing experiences you'll ever, even going out, even going to the MCG for, you know, this year I've taken my son a few times um, to the MCG and just to see the eyes of, you know, how amazingly big it is and, you know, yeah. going to the, you know, 60, 70,000 people in the stadium all cheering against each other, all sort of stuff is, is something that you'll always remember and cherish, most definitely. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, those moments are very special, but you did mention that there are also difficult times. Um, so if you can talk through maybe like, yeah. you know, how many concussions or head traumas do you think you've experienced? Is there one that you could share that maybe stood out for you? I think my, um, I, 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 so over my period of time, and for those that don't know who or how I played football, um, I was I was quite crash and bash, and you know I was quite a contested ball, a contested sort of a contested footy person, and that's how I played. And I 
and I wore my heart on my sleeve in how I played it. And I always knew that if I wasn't the hardest at the ball, uh, that was sort of just my badge of honour and how I worked it out. And, you know, obviously I wasn't the hardest in the competition, all that sort of stuff, because there's uh, many other champions going up against with that sort of thing. But for the way I played footy, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't too many weeks that went by that I didn't have some sort of knock, you know, and I'm talking every week. But and not to a point where I would call a a there's, there's fine lines, right? There's, there's, there's levels of where we talk about this head trauma thing and then brain trauma. There's the ones where you just get like little stingers or there's like a little brush or it's just something to, to, to knock, but it's not a knock sort of thing. But we're talking about things that then actually shake you up um, or ones where it actually is dulling into a certain sort of spot. Um, you know, over my, when I talk about that, as I said, every week I would probably get a head knock. Um, you know, right from my junior days right through to when I stopped playing footy when I was 36 years of age. So it's, um, but in terms of real public concussions and head traumas, ones were actually sort of being recognised um, and should have been treated. And you go, okay, we're going to talk about that in a second as well, but probably should have been treated. I, I probably would have had close to 30 over, over my sort of junior and, and senior footy career. So it's, um, there's, a, there's a few that stand out. Um, one of my biggest ones was I was playing against, and this is an impact one. So, and as we know, uh, there's two different types of concussions that you can get. There's ones from impact and there's ones that are whiplash head uh, concussions, you know, the actual mm. brain shakes. Yeah. So there's totally different ones. Brain shakes weren't quite an issue for me because I sort of believe the, the strength that I had around my neck and the, the training that I was able to do, it actually allowed me to better be able to support that. So it probably didn't have such an impact. It was more the, the impact ones that, that got me. I got that, I was going to Shepherd, um, I was playing against, I was playing at Hawthorne, I was playing against North Melbourne, and I had this uh, amazingly white sort of mohawk hair back in the day. Um, and I just, I, I think I was, it was fresh off close to the, uh, that David Beckham sort of time where, where he put all that out sort of thing. Anyway, I was uh, going to Shepherd and uh, the player ran straight at me, jumped up and elbow hit me straight uh, here. You can see the scars that are all there. So mm -hmm. I um, sort of broke, uh, broke my jaw, displaced my jaw, broke two, broke two cheekbones, all that sort of stuff, and, and dented a, um, and fractured up into, into my skull um, from that hit. Um, and then I was like, I was out cold. And uh, that was sort of obviously I don't remember it. Obviously, they're seeing on the on the footage uh, and the impact that that had, and with all the blood going through my hair, and it looked like so much worse because I was you know it was hot and sweaty and all that sort of stuff. And then I had the white hair, but um, you know that that took a long time to recover from. Um, lucky it was at the end of the season. I think we had two games or one game left, and in you know the treatment that I got. So I had to have surgery and lots of stuff, but the treatment that I got from um, being just really notified to, to be able to rest, um, mm. you know, and, and, we, and we're going to talk about it, obviously, Anita, the fact that how, how could it have been better supported back in the day um, when I was playing, most definitely. And there's a lot going on at the moment, but, you know, I, I believe I was pretty lucky. Through, through my AFL career, I, I probably had three of the best doctors um, and medical teams that were available going around, um, you know, and and they a lot of the and those medical teams that, that were supporting us, they they saved a lot of guys. I reckon they saved a lot of guys from themselves, a lot of players from themselves, and I was pretty pretty fortunate that was the case. Um, but you, it's it's about well, obviously, what we're trying to do here with CLF is is trying to create more awareness for the players to save themselves not having yes. other people do it for them. So, um, and I think that's the big thing that's shifted. That's that, that's that cultural piece that's shifted, I believe, um, in making sure that players are understanding, okay, this is what the impact is having, even from this small level. If I do this again, this could happen. So if I'm self-reporting, and this is what we, we pull this back to mental health as well, right? If we're self, if we're more aware of the, the the impacts and things that are going on, the activities, the experiences, and the reactions and the actions that it has on me, if I'm being able to self-report earlier and identify it earlier, the better my chances are of recovery. If I think that I'm invincible to the to the impacts of concussion, to the impacts through mental health and, and not having a mental health diagnosis, whatever it might be, if I think I'm invincible to these ways of life, 
and then it's going to come and bite me on the ass. And that's yeah. as, as simple as it is. And, you know, we, we from the, the, you know, the work that we've been doing so far, hearing and hearing more people share their stories around that it has, doesn't have to be a series of impacts over a long period of time. It's just not being supported on that first time, maybe. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's where people sort of, we're, we're sort of trying to create a greater awareness and education around it. The fact that, um, you know, and you're not really, you don't really, some people see the immediate effects. I myself, 100% I saw the immediate effects at the certain times of doing it. You know, you had your headaches, you had the dizziness, you had all those sorts of things. You had the space, the fact that you couldn't actually stand up or you couldn't sit down, you couldn't do all sorts of stuff, that vertigo type feeling that comes through with it. Um, yes. But you just sort of, as I said, if you don't report that to the doctor, you can't be supported through that. So being able to try to save yourself from that and understanding it and, and not thinking that you're invincible because we're not, you know, we, we something's going to happen to us uh, sooner or later, right? So let's Absolutely. just hope it's not concussion and impact that brain trauma has. And I think it's really important what you're saying is because today we are moving into the space where it is important that we do report and, um, you know, you don't have to wear that badge of honour uh, right. like those days and I guess the two things are we've got the concussion space and then we've got the repetitive head impacts which mm. could uh, lead to a CTE um, yep. type of diagnosis in the future so yep. there's a lot happening in the space and we're hoping to raise awareness Lance what? share with us your journey once you finished our AFL because I know that Ooh. you had a, a bit of a struggle um, a of share, yeah. uh, share with uh, us your story yes Thanks, Anita. So, yeah, a lot of my struggles actually started pre-footy. Um, okay, you know, pre-footy. Just, yeah. just a lot of, it was probably that sort of that age and everyone being able to share their different stories around being a teenager and how that worked for them or didn't work for them. Um, but working through all that was was quite an interesting experience of being a teenager at that time. And, you know, with the sports and with my school and social aspects, uh, you know, family challenges that are coming through, um, but yeah, sort of just like everyone, a majority of people be able to tell their their, their experience you know, related to anxiety and how the sort of uh, social dis dysfunction, we'll call it, um, in their life at the time. But obviously, this is going on nearly thirty years ago. So this is the conversations once again that we weren't we weren't having back at the time. So, but we are much better at having now. But you know, you know, and this is the thing, like. The more I look back on it, is it is it the fact of the social dysfunction, you know, it, it actually then connecting that with the physical aspects that was actually happening to me because from my sport, whether it be physical in terms of my actual body or actually the injuries that I was getting into my head, um, you know, I, I, I look back on it, you know, I've I've got something like 12 or 13 different, I think if I find the right scars, I've got something like 12 or 13 different impacts of uh, stitches that I've had to have in my head, all over my head. So, you know, you look at that sort of thing and then you go, okay, how early was that in terms of the relationship between my mental health and the sport injuries or the physical or brain injuries that I was having at the time? Um, but, you know, my, my battles really sort of, they, they, they became really deep when I was in my early 20s. Um, you know, sort of a lot of, and the same thing, you know, we're talking 20 years ago that these conversations weren't being had. Um, you know, the, the awareness or even being involved in a such an alpha male sort of toxic culture. You know, I'm saying those clubs were culture, you know, toxic. I'm talking about the AFL as a system um, and the Aussie way of life is quite toxic in how we try to actually understand how we deal with life, right? So, um, you know, and then the way I known, knew how to deal with it, and I didn't know at the time, but I was dealing with it through alcohol and then, then became drugs and you know, and then post 40, so the, the, the drugs, uh, you know, sort of abusing through my system, um, you know, still functioning and still being and still doing and still socialising and still working, um, still playing footy at the time. Um, but just internal, just like internal, I call it internal warfare. It was just, it, just nothing, nothing seemed good enough or I couldn't work through it or I couldn't understand it you know, you're dealing with conflict or the, you know, those weeks that I couldn't get out of bed because of my depression and it was just sort of going to a point where, um, you know, I, I multiple times over a period of, of uh, you know, three to four years that I, um, I, you know, I thought that suicide was my answer. 
um, you know, but you know, it, it, where does it, where does, where does the accountability lie with that, right? You know, is it the support systems that aren't, aren't available to you, or is it yourself that's actually not putting yourself into that position to be supported? Um, are, you, are you playing the victim game here, or are we trying to be more proactive with your support services and your systems within within yourself and understanding the care of self and how that works? Um, or the fact that you just that's a part of your journey, right? It might not be the, the the textbook sort of stuff of way of life, but that's a part of your journey. And um, hopefully we can just keep putting that best foot forward, you know, and, and move it through. Um, you know, hopefully you come out the other side. But you know, we know that there's not a lot of people um, that are able that are actually able to tell that story or feel comfortable enough to be able to tell that story and actually own their story through that space because. There's experiences in life that are that are taking over, and you know, if, if we relate this back to the fact that the more work that we're doing here with this, with CLF, and um, obviously you talked about just you just noted the fact of the what CTE is doing, and you know, talking about being able to sort of be able to diagnose or pre-diagnose CTE sort of thing. You know, there's the Wally Lewis thing that came out just recently about the potential of CTE. You know, yes. how accurate how accurate is that type of data and information because you know, we're being told that it can't be sort of sort of um, diagnosed, and you know, until you're after your death. So, that's, that's correct. Yes, it is something you can't diagnose. And um, I guess since we're talking about this, I mean, I know that you did have um, a lot of struggles mentally, and thank you so much for sharing that. It okay. must have been really difficult. Um, but when did you maybe think that your mental health issues may have been linked to your concussions and head head impacts in football oh not until you just brought it up anita i don't think no yeah. um yeah. <laughs> um now i i think there's a little while ago um you know sort of it's probably about four or five years ago i started thinking that there may have been a relationship or maybe in a connection between it um but the way I sort of understand it with myself is that there's a whole range of the there's a whole range of factors that have uh, brought me to this space. Um, could my concussions? Could my physical injuries? Could the repeated head knocks? Could my social dysfunction? Could the the, the substance abuse? Or could uh, the alcohol that I was drinking at the time? Could you know my 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 anger, my moods, my DNA was my chemical makeup? Is that all these factors that we talk about? Um, you know, they obviously brought me to where I was. Um, mm -hmm. But I look at those things, but, and I say this in the nicest possible way, is that me, I, I myself, I get asked a lot about those impacts and those factors that, are, that have brought me to that space and why did I have to, why was I, you know, diagnosed with a mental health, why did I have a mental health diagnosis? Or why was I into the substance abuse? Or why was I into that? But I look at it now and go, because it was a part of my journey. And if I actually use that as a powerful thing, you know, mm -hmm. I use that as my strength and my courage and my actually way of going moving forward and say, okay, that was the things that got me there. But how does the things, how I, how do I own those parts of my life to actually make myself, make myself the strongest and best version of myself now? And what, so what, what, what did you do? What were the things that you did to pull yourself out of that struggle? Pull myself out of conversations, right? They're, 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 that, was, that was the first thing that I did. It was, it was, you know, the conversation with my wife at the time, you know, not my wife at the time, she's my wife, she's she's still here. Yeah. So she's probably in the background there sort of you know, having, a, having a neat job. But um, my wife, you know, at the time of being able to have that conversation and being able to recognise that support was, was the crucial first step for me. And then actually going, okay, how do I create accountability in that? What all support do I need here? Um, and who, who, how am I going to get that support? So I had my doctor, I had uh, my best mate's mum, who I spoke to a lot about this as well, because she's a she's a head nurse, nursing, and, you know, has dealt with sort of the the drug and alcohol world, uh, you know, part of as a part of her work. So I felt comfortable in talking to her. And once I got to that point, then I actually then sort of with my mum. You know, I was having a lot of these conversations, which you know, I was having a lot of these conversations with mum as it was, but not to the depths that I that I needed to. Um, so we talk about this thing about self-reporting, right? So I was having these conversations with my mum, but I couldn't have that deep enough conversation that I needed her to support me. So it's a tricky one to understand. But you know, I went and saw a psychiatrist. 
And then my relationship with life about came about, okay, who am I, who am I social, where's my social standing? What's my social health care look like here? Who am I doing life with? Um, you know, what am I doing with my life? How am I, you know, what's, what physical activity am I doing here? You know, and then I, I started walking and I started walking a lot, you know, I was sort of walking morning and morning and night um, every day. And I was, you know, I was getting up and, getting up at the crack of the dawn, getting out of the door before the, you know, the sun come up and not getting home for a couple of hours and doing the same thing at night. And um, that was a big part of what my life was about, just giving that headspace to be able to sort of think through what was going on and where you need to be. Did a whole lot of journaling, um, you know, and I believe this is a really sort of powerful tool that a lot of people don't use, um, whether, whether you're going through, you know, challenges or not. Um, you know, it can be quite empowering and actually just getting the sort of the voices out of your head uh, onto a piece of paper and working through those processes a lot. Um, and, you know, this is a little bit of a left left of a left field sort of one. I started reading a lot of Buddhism books mm, okay. at the time. Yeah, 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 I get the same response every time. I need to worry about it. And they're like, what are you, what's going on here? And, and, but I didn't do it to become a Buddhist and that sort of thing. I thought, well, who, who are the people that are actually the most calmest and the happiest people in the, in the world, right? And I thought, well, Dalai Lama, and I have been seeing the Dalai Lama when he came out to Melbourne uh, yeah, 20 years ago. But I, and I, I thought, well, so obviously they, there's something there. There's something in this space that's actually working for them. So what can I take from them to go, okay, this is how it works. So you know, there's lots of learnings that I took from that and being able to sort of be at peace with yourself and, and working through that process and slowing down and making sure you're in time. Um, you know, and it's not about the fact that everything's a negative, but the, with that negative becomes a positive. There's all things that uh, sort of uh, take that way and, you know, sort of carry them, carry them on through my life now. And I still do the same things. I still journal. I still, you know, sort of uh, I'll, I'll take a Buddhism, a bit of reading every now and then. You know, physical exercise is obviously a big thing and conversations are a, a huge part of my life. And I think some really great tips there, you know, like you said, the journals, exercise, uh, your support network and who who you're yeah. with and who's there, um, you know, books, all these things are great tips for people who, you know, yeah. maybe having a similar experience. And obviously before, one last question and we'll open it up to the floor. Yeah, cool. um, you know, your foundation, okay, I know yeah. that launch this in 2013 as love yeah. me love me is now um you know changing uh names as, as you speak so maybe yeah. share with us oh, a little great. bit about your foundation and then we'll oh, open cool. up to people who have got questions thank you beautiful thanks for that uh, yeah as i said i, I so to that i'm going to sort of trace it back to why i started the foundation in the first place i started it because i'd been through my experiences which i've, which I've just talked about um, end of 2011 was my last suicide attempt or my last concept of where I was actually going to execute uh, through my, um, with my, my, six, my suicide thoughts. So, um, yeah, and then I thought, well, actually, there's more to life and I was getting a support and doing all the things for myself and making it work. And then 2013, I thought, this is it, right? And then we, so we started and we, we launched the, we opened the foundation and, you know, this is a Ted conversation piece around the fact that, and I had a lot of people uh, tell me, well, I was sort of wasting my time and why am I doing this and how are you going to, how are you going to live through this and, you know, what are you going to do? And, and you know, it's been a roller coaster ever since, but, you know, 10 years on, um, you know, some amazing experiences, some absolutely devastating experiences that I've had to deal with as well with, with people and dealing and supporting people through different experiences and, you know, the amount of conversations I've had around with people, you know, family or friends, old people that have suicided um, or died by suicide is, is you know, is, is, you know, for some people, um, it's really difficult, you know, and it is difficult, but, you know, you, you always think about, as I said, what's happening on the other side and um, it's not about sort of uh, stepping in other people's shoes, it's about being able to walk that experience with them um, and that's what we sort of try to help people through. But, you know, 10 years on, um, as I said, it's been a roller coaster, but we're sort of, uh, we've taken the real sort of strategic way of where we're going for the next 10 years and how, that's, how that could possibly look. And, um, you know, changing our name to the Never Alone Foundation, I think is a huge part of that. It's been our, uh, it's been a trademark of ours uh, and, a, and a, our mantra um, since we started. Um, but we believe the message around Never Alone is really important one. 
and that people are sort of really connect to the idea of what that looks like. So, um, and you know, and the not-for-profit space, as you as you well finding out, Anita, it's a really tricky space to live to live in right now. Um, you know, the way of life is a really tricky one for sort of you know we're talking about funding. Like it's it's not-for-profit doesn't mean that we need all the funding, but we need we still need funding to operate, right? So people sort of in the people that aren't in the not-for-profit world, you'll understand this: the fact that. The school it still needs to function. You still need to function. You still need to have, you know, sort of. Um, it's not all. It is majority volunteer based and how it all works. But there's still certain things that need to be paid for. Still need to be done. Even if you're creating the impact for the people on the other side, then it's all good. So as an organisation, especially in the mental health space, where the mental health space is just obviously forever demanding and there's higher need in terms of, you know, between education, resources, support work, um, you know, awareness for mental health is, is sort of really not as much needed now because, um, you know, where have you been for the last 10 years? Pretty much if you haven't heard around the mental health space, but it's about actually equipping people, equipping people with awareness. So when I talk about equipping people with awareness, it's about actually equipping them with the tools to create sort of understandings around social conversations, the impact that they're having through with each other, actually how do we increase their social health, which obviously impacts their mental health. Um, and I think that's a big part of where we're getting to in this space. And, uh, you know, for us at Neverland Foundation, it's about actually having other organisations come in under the sort of working through the, uh, the umbrella and joining forces and making sure this army works together um, and we're not fighting against each other just because we need to make a buck. And that's not how it works. I think it's really important for people in this space to understand that there's thousands and thousands of mental health and suicide prevention organisations in the country. Um, we as an organisation, uh, Love Me, Love You, now Never Alone Foundation, we are one of 24 organisations that are accredited to deliver a, a suicide prevention type program um, mm -hmm. or suicide prevention training. So, you know, out of all the thousands that are in there, we're, we're one of 24. So it's sort of, you know, you've got to find that point of difference, you've got to find that credibility. Um, but in the end, it's, you know, people, people in the society, and I talked about it at the start, we talked about the fact that we got to help people understand how they save themselves, right? Yeah. Not waiting for everybody else to do it for them. So it's, um, you know, how do we equip people? But, you know, the work that I do, I'm very passionate about. Um, obviously, I've been doing it for a long time now. But I love what I do. I love who I get to do it with. Um, and, the, and the doors that has opened for me in terms of conversations and relationships with people um you know and, and you know no greater example than uh, me meeting you through the work that you know we come in through the rmit and Eda and then being able to then connect further and keep going through here and then actually going okay well you know the work that we're doing at clf um you know it's, it's just it's obviously just started in australia but the impact is just on the, the wheels of turning um but, uh, you know, and I'm very excited to be a part of it all, most definitely. No, we're, we're really lucky to have you. And I think, you know, suicide prevention is such an important aspect. So, um, you know, I love the name too, Never Alone. Look, I've got a question in the chat from Chris Fox. Hi, Chris, I hope you're well. Um, cool. Did you notice it was easier to get concussed after happening a few times? Uh, he was a boxer. He also played rugby league and was always regarded as pretty tough, like yourself, but wasn't as durable after being concussed a few times. So a question for you there. Yeah, well, I think it depends on, it depends on the, the, the recovery process. This is my, my, my understanding from it all, my experiences as well, right? If you don't allow the recovery process to work better for you, you know, in terms of the actual time and actually try to put, and it's not about the contact recovery, but it's actually still the physical movement recovery that we we'll actually need through the space to make sure that they can get to that point where I'm up and at them again. So, um, did I did I think it was uh, easier in terms of uh, becoming more concussed or getting a, a sort of being more susceptible to concussions that way? For myself, I don't believe it was. Um, because I actually was probably, as I said, I had a lot of knocks to the head, but I didn't have a lot of those, not every week was a concussion. Every time I was reported and actually having a concussion, I think it was only one time as a junior that I actually sort of uh, 
have uh, have a notable sort of a concussion and actually went back out on the field. But it wasn't because we just, we just didn't know any different. Um, and I'm saying, well, it's fault. It's not how it worked. I just sort of just go, okay, I'm back out. No one, there was no trainers or that sort of stuff. It was just how we played. So, um, but throughout my AFL career, you know, the recoveries that I needed to do, I did. Um, you know, there was one thing, the results, we'll call it back in the day, um, with the written test that was done, you know, you sort of fudge your results at the start of the year. So when you actually had, we were working cash and we had to do the test um, throughout the season, that uh, if you stuffed it up, it didn't really matter because you'd already stuffed it up. So, but that was the culture of how we did it. Right? So, um, you know, it sounds I, I think like that, your concussions were managed quite I, I, I believe they were. The ones that were actually notable, when I talk about notable ones, the ones that were actually, uh, I couldn't sort of, uh, I couldn't not self report it, sort of thing. Um, okay. yeah, working that through. Um, obviously, as I said, there's a lot of head shakes that I got over that period of time. Um, but the, you know, those were just were like stingers that that I you dealt with. Um, you know, you, you'd sort of obviously report them to the doctor. As I said, it depends on the relationship you had with the doctor as well. Mm. How trusting do you think you were with the, with the person that's actually trying to look after you? And this is like we do anything in life. How trusting you are of that person is actually going to help you and look after you. Um, so, you know, a, a different sports are different, Anita. So we're, we're talking about footy, we're going to talk about soccer, we're going to talk about, you know, we talk about American sports, uh, the contact sport, you know, NFL, it's all working through there. Boxing's a different thing, you know, lacrosse is a really angry sort of type of sport. We're going to talk about rugby, which is, I love rugby, but I love what they're trying to do, but there still is, there's the innocuous hits that are actually causing the greatest of impacts. It's not mm -hmm. actually the sort of, but, you know, is, is the precautionary levels that we need to be taking takes actually accountability and a responsibility for players to be able to look out for each other in that space. Yeah. yeah. But you've got to be able to train that as well. So mm -hmm. it's um, and some people are just, just, some people just, they're just prone to getting hit, <laughs> right? It's, look, it, I think, it, yeah, it's, it's one of those things help. where, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, we're becoming more aware of this now that if you yeah. are getting hit a lot, then it, there are yeah. could be discussions around how you could, um, you know, treat that better or perhaps change sports. I've got a, yeah. another question here. Yeah. This is yeah. Kate yeah. needs. Can you share what sort of struggles you have day to day in public and what strategies you use to get around these challenging situations? What sort of struggles I have day to day? The same struggles that you have day to day, Kate. It's um, you know, the, the stress, the, the stresses of life you know, how it's impacting everybody is, is different, right? So there's different ways and there's different triggers um, that, are, that are impacting all of our lives. And you know, some of the day to day struggles that I have now uh you know sort of concentration concentration through very longer periods of time is a big thing but that's that's been something that it's been an issue for me since i was four <laughs> right so that's sort of the things i'm not talking about it's been related from a concussions that sort of thing um yeah my moods my moods still fluctuate quite heavily um you know sort of i'm not so sort of quite aggressive or anything anymore which i was when i was playing footy and, and post footy um but, uh, you know, I'm quite an emotional sort of guy as well, you know, so that's sort of just who I am and how, how I've grown into who I am as a person. Um, you know, I fluctuate and ride that roller coaster like everybody else. But, you know, the way I deal with life is, is you know, what works for me is, is as I said, the physical exercise thing for me is is huge in, in terms of, you know, talk about strength training and, and you know intensity and interval training we're training with intensity to these sorts of things that work for me um you know i believe that the ability and there's a lot of research going around it in terms of its, its ability to develop and improve resilience and, and your ways of life and mindfulness and all that sort of stuff to actually create a, a greater platform for your for your day um you know for me that works you know i'm i'm up at four o'clock in the morning go to the gym, I meditate, do my breath work, and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll train. And, you know, I'm lifting heavier and stronger, and I'm stronger now than when I was playing footy, and I'm 43 years of age. So it's, um, you know, that's the, what works for me. You know, I don't drink alcohol. I think this is a big thing that people are sort of really missing in life is mm -hmm. the fact that they need the alcohol levels to actually socially create a, a, an environment for themselves. 
Um, and I'm not saying that you don't do it, but I'm saying the fact that there's some challenges going on in your life, the last thing that you should be doing is actually in, in sort of putting fuel on the fire with alcohol, I believe. Um, you know, my nutrition's down, you know, I love my treats still, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not obsessive compulsive anymore because I've, I've, I've become a lot easier and a lot calmer in how I go about things. But the biggest thing for me, you know, in terms of we talk about tools that we use is I, I just love spending time with my boys. You know, my, 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 my two sons is, um, and, you know, hanging out with my wife and just being able to just do nothing without, you know, without being anything and by actually going, hey, that was a great time. So yeah. um, a different, different tool that different people use. Journaling, as I said, is still a, is still a thing that I do. You know, I, I don't do as much with the, uh, the pen and paper anymore because technology, this is how it works, right? So, you know, I, I write a lot in my notes, my phone, um, you know, just sort of, I just, and you know, my wife, she'll say, oh, what are you doing like right now? I'll be writing my phone and I just, Actually, I'll just I give me five. I just need to, you know, and that could be mid conversation, that could be mid experience, that could be at dinner, it could be anywhere. I was just allowing myself to get those sort of thoughts out of your head. Actually, I need to brain dump here, um, yeah. which I believe works for me. And yeah. I think, like, I mean, I'll get to Reese's, Reese's question yeah. in a moment, but Marty Dunn is just asking you have you noticed yourself slipping in any way mentally, like having a shorter fuse, being less tolerable? question yourself and self-worth and I think in some ways you just answered that because right. you said you use a lot of these mindfulness you meditate you exercise yep. Yep. Um, so perhaps you just want to make a comment for Marty yeah I think I think Marty I think it's a really important question and, and, and most definitely I think it's more the fact that you, every, everyone sees themselves slipping at time there, there are going to be always moments in life where our self-worth is not uh, to the level that we want it to be um but, you know, there's, there's this ways of life in terms of being tolerable of, of, you know, I'm not very tolerable of idiots, you know, and, and people that don't sort of, that have a hidden agenda in their life. I'm not very tolerable with that. It's just the way I, I deal with it. It's, you know, it's probably from my, my, my dad is that we call people out on those sorts of things or we make that sure that those people know that we don't like what they're going through or they're doing. But... A soccer, soccer player, wasn't my he? Dad, my soccer dad played soccer roos, yeah. So back, yeah. In the, back in the old days. So it's uh, he blames me for his career going downhill because he played soccer roos before I, just before I was born. So and oh. as soon as I was born, it uh, sort of dropped off the cliff a little bit. No, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it just... I don't think I'm many, I actually think I'm a lot calmer now, but I think, as I said, there's there's the impact that you can see. If you're aware of these things, and we're talking about creating awareness, you know, creating more self-awareness in terms of your ability to in, in understand those experiences, you understand, if you want to play the victim, you'll keep going down those roads and understand how it works, or not, sorry, not understand how it works for you, and you'll actually then go into a no-through road and you'll keep banging your head on that wall. Or you could be aware of it, understand it, and go, how am I going to deal with this? What am I going to do with this? What was the actions? What is the actions I need to do for myself to put myself in a better position to experience that better moving forward? Um, you know, and I and I think you've got to find your tools that actually allow that to do because the, the thing that we talk about in life when we talk about mental health is the fact that people are always are trying to look, people are always trying to treat the effect, right? In terms of in terms of the effect is what we call depression or is it is the mental health diagnosis or whatever it is. People are trying to treat that. And that's why people keep lapsing. That's why people keep sort of falling back into the dark, into the black dog and all those sorts of things. That's why people keep working. It's not treating the effect, but we're trying to treat the cause. So what's the underlying cause of why I've got here? How did I get here? What's the experience that I need to understand here to make sure that I can move it forward with myself? So, you know, there's many ways that we deal with things in life. You know, there's there are probably times that uh, you know I'm not the person that I should be, um, or that I would like to be, um, but that's being human, right? That's just how it works. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure and expectation on us as a society um, to be, you know, to be amazing all the time. You can't keep up with that. You know, you, you can't work that. Life's life's not about being ten out of ten all the time. You can't do that. You may, you will have those experiences, yes, that you are a ten out of ten in that ex, in that experience, but that's not going to be your day. That's not going to be your weekend. That's not going to be your month. It's not going to help work. And you were talking about the impact of well, what all of these things that are happening in our life. 
you know, you got to find you better find your base camp. What's 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 sustainable for me in terms of my expectation of my life and how I'm going to live it. Um, you know, is my life actually going okay in terms of all the aspects? Is my mental health good? Is my physical health at a level it needs to be? Is my social health at a level it needs to be? Yeah. And if you actually can connect all those dots and actually take care of the thing that's inside your skull, <laughs> you know, we're all going to be a lot better off. Yeah. Yeah. No, Marty's just saying thank you. He agrees. Um, he's slowly learning from what you're saying. So thanks cool. for sharing. Um, before I'm just trying to get, I think they might quickly do three. I just want to, that Reese, Reese is just asking you, how do we protect athletes from themselves? Um, by this, it means a fear of being dropped um, for the next week. <laughs> you can play yeah. speak up versus, um, you know, staying quiet. Just quickly, a few tips because I want to yeah. get through more questions. Oh, I, yeah? I think this is a cultural thing that we need to get around. And I think the, the work that we're doing at CLF is going to help these players understand that a lot better. Um, and, you know, the fact that we're seeing um, seeing the impact that it's having on, uh, on, on athletes in the past or from generations past um, and not being able to support them and being able to be supported, I think that's, uh, that's a huge cultural shift that is starting to happen. Um, you know, people are recognising it more. And depending on what level you're at with your, with your sport, I think in terms of how comfortable you are to actually self-report and understand that there's a lot long lot longer in life than next week so yeah absolutely and i think um you know we've got the parliamentary inquiry coming out soon yeah so who knows what the future holds in terms of getting the message out there andrew yep. brown um just yep. wants to a question did you notice yep. if a particular concussion or incident impacted you or, or your mental health oh great question andrew but i don't, I don't think there was a the one in particular uh and I so said, there's a series of them that happen, but there's like, that's life, right? There's a series of things that happen in your life that bring you to a point. And it's not usually one thing, um, you know, sort of that sort of ripple effect of life. You know, we talk about the, the, the amount of concussions or, you know, talk about the amount of brain trauma, head trauma that I had over a period of time from the broken bones in my nose and my sinus and my, my eye sockets and my jaw, you know, to the amount of stitches that I had from directing back to the amount of times that I've actually sort of, um, you know, uh, have done to the abuse of actually uh, contested footy for such a long period of time. You know, there's not one incident that I would put down. That's most definitely. But you know, as I said, it's, that's my story. That's that's my yes. experience. Um, it's not the same for everybody. Some people, you know, we're talking about with uh, with Lydia. You know, she had that that uh, that that one that really rocked her. You know, Lydia Pingle. Is that right? Is that right, Anita? Yeah, yeah, she had. Yep. Yeah, she had that one that just like really rocked her and then didn't get really supportive for what she needed to and then tried to come back too much and then it sort of shook her out. So but, um, we'll hopefully have her on a webinar. We're going to have some of the women talk as yeah. well. About uh, and, 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 and as, as you bring that up, you know, we're, we're talking about professional sports. and uh, You know, we're talking about this male versus female conversation, right? It's, it's, it's really important because obviously the first first female athlete that was just re, uh, diagnosed with uh, and with a CTE okay. um, uh, a footballer I believe AFL, AFLW player is it, is it correct yes. um, uh, you know but the, the the ways of training and and the biological makeup of how our bodies are made to to train and to be receptive of knocks or physical knocks or that sort of stuff historically it's been a lot different. Okay, and there's obviously more research with training programs and exercise science about how that actually the female um, the female sports system is training them better to be able to survive and actually thrive in their sport, not just be a sports person. Yeah, so not just play the sport. So, and I think this is a really important one when we talk about head trauma and, and the physical ability to actually you know, have that strength and support yep. around the systems that actually allow it, it's it's, yeah. it's really important to understand. I think that kind of leads us into our last question. And I think yeah. um, what at CLF, what we're advocating for is the yep. children's sport. We want to have um, less tackling practice sessions, um, you know, yep. more flag type football at a younger age because the statistics have shown that um, you're more at risk of developing CTE if you... Yep play for a longer period of time no. particularly yeah. from a child so the question that ian's got here is um you know you've got sons they're playing footy yeah. 
Yeah. What precautions do you think we should be looking at for junior football? How do you feel about your boys playing football, et cetera? Yeah, I, I coached my, my son's under eight uh, footy team this year, um, which is an amazing experience in being able to sort of share that with him um, and the other kids, the other boys that were in my team. Um, yeah, and we had a great year of learning and, and, and fun and all that sort of stuff. There was, um, you know, some experiences. We In under eight footy, they uh, bear tackle. Yeah, so you just it's bear hugs and that sort of thing. There's no taking to the ground or sort of stuff. Obviously, they're not sort of running at uh, sort of dramatic speeds where sort of those uh, those head knocks are going to happen as much. Um, but obviously, under tens, it goes up again, and and you know, it's full tackling and sort of stuff. I, I, I believe that there's modifications that can be made at that sort of under under eights, under tens, under twelves level of, of footy. Uh, in a, in a, my experiences, we're talking about AFL. Um, there's some modifications around that that we could that, that could be looked at, um, but it's at the, at that level. It's not the aggression of the tackling that is the thing. It's the two kids that sort of go down to get the ball at the same time and hit each other in the head. Those sorts of ones that are happening, I think, at that type of level. Um, you know, but if we're teaching them the right ways around attacking the ball and attacking the contest and actually using our body for the purpose of getting the ball and benefiting your team. I think it, there's a fair bit to do with the coaching, not so much the player. Um, that, that that sort of needs to be looked at here uh, for, those, for those real junior levels because it gets quite serious when you talk about 14s, 16s, 18s and, and above. So clearly, um, you know, we I know that there's the, the amount of tackling that goes on at training is a big thing, okay? And, you know, there's more tackling bags that, that are being used now, not sort of using an opponent, uh, using a physical opponent to do this sort of tackling stuff. But then, you know, the, then you're sort of fighting against it because you don't tackle a bag in a game. You go to try to tackle a person. So the bag doesn't move. So the, there's just ways I think that it's actually being more open to the opportunities of to say, okay, a, a lot of training now is what we call, and, and, and it frustrates me to a point, but the, people are, the generation coming through, uh, they're not being coached or taught how to play the sport. They're actually getting taught how to train, <laughs> right? So they're actually training, they, they, and they and they start playing like that. They start playing like witches hats and they start sort of doing that sort of stuff. So yeah. they're actually not being taught how to actually play the game or coached how to play the game properly to the point. They're actually yeah. training them to train, which is, um, which is why people are getting frustrated with it all. But yeah, look, there's, there's a lot, lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. I think there's a lot more research to come out. And, and I think as we progress, things hopefully will start to shift where we can put these protections in place. Definitely. Thank you, friends, for joining us Thank today. It's been amazing. Um, you know, I just want to mention that if you do, uh, if, if you do feel like someone is suffering, someone you love is suffering from um, any sort of uh, suspected symptoms or yep. need to talk to someone, please reach out to our CLF helpline. Um, our Australian one has officially launched and we have people that can uh, address your concerns and, and help you there. Also, um, you know, we, we have a few upcoming webinars that are, are coming up next. So we've got... Um, We've got basically uh, James Graham, who was an NRL great. He's going to be uh, on one of our webinars. And then we've oh. also got Anita Frawley, who's going to share her journey and message of hope for us all. So there'll be a few more coming up after that as well. But if you haven't registered, please uh, get on there as well. Um, also, if with the foundation, if you, these events run for free, if there's anything that you can do, um, or if you found this helpful, uh, you know, please feel free to, um, you know, donate any amount. It doesn't matter what it is. Or even just, you know, send us a, an email. Perhaps you want to get involved in some way or perhaps there's another way that you could, uh, could uh, sort of help us with what we're doing at CLF. But thank you, Lance. Uh, I think it's been amazing to have you to share your story. Um, it's very brave of you to come on and, and, and share the struggles that you've had. And hopefully what you've said has offered some support for many people uh, on this call today and those that are watching the recording. So thank you very much. Thank you to our audience as well for coming along. And um, we really, um, you know, hope that, that we can all together find ways moving forward and support each other and keep talking, keep having conversations about 
our health, our mental health, what we can do. And I think, Lance, you've offered some great um, tips and advice for us all. No, I appreciate it, Anita. As I said, and thanks everyone for joining in. And as I said, hopefully you take this conversation moving forward and we can have that impact that we need to have. So appreciate it, Anita. No worries. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. No. Goodbye.